Hi, everybody, and welcome to our new sermon series, Collapse, where we're going to be going through the book of Malachi. I'm Pastor Schoen, and I want to thank you, whether you're worshiping from Word of Life, Christ our Savior, New Song, or anywhere else in the world. We're just so grateful that you're here worshiping as we go through this Lenten journey, and we think about God's words through the prophet Malachi for his people. Now, over the next five weeks, God is going to challenge us with some of the words that he gives to Malachi to say to his chosen people. But we first want to remember the words that start the book of Malachi. And this is what Malachi says. I have loved you, says the Lord. And what it means is that the people of God at that time weren't sure if God truly loved them and if he was really with them. They had gone through a lot of things. But through these words, And through the way in which God is then going to challenge them, he first wants to start by reminding the people that he is not done. And we are reminded of this, that he is never done extending his grace to us and reminding us that he is always with us and that he will always love us. Even though there are some times he has to talk to us about the things that we're doing wrong. And so we hope and pray that this sermon series over these next five weeks, this time of worship that we have together, will help you grow as you think about the power of Jesus Christ and the way in which he has fulfilled everything of the Old Testament, the way he has given us the power and the grace and the opportunity to receive these messages from our Heavenly Father and to overcome the challenges of sin and to move forward with his grace and with his love. Now tonight we're going to talk about the priests and the challenging words that God has for the priests at the time of Malachi. Now over the course of generations, there weren't as many priests as there were in the Old Testament. And so what it's going to talk about is the sacrifices that the priests were making to God and some of the problems that were with that. And the question that we want to take away or we want to think about and we're going to explore over the course of this worship service is how do we sometimes, no matter who we are, act like the priests of the Old Testament? So I hope and pray that you are encouraged and you are inspired through the different elements of this service. And we want to think about that as we worship our Heavenly Father in song, where we sing all creatures of our God and King to return the praise that we have to Him. And we'll sing that song in just a minute, but we definitely want to start with a prayer. So I encourage and invite you, no matter where you're from or where you're at, that you would pray with me, please. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks as we begin this Lenten journey thinking about what God's Word is. And we think about your words for us, Heavenly Father, that you have loved us, that you continue to love us, and that you will never stop extending your grace and mercy to us when we follow you. And so, Heavenly Father, be with us on this Lenten journey as we study your words from Malachi. In Jesus' name, amen. Lit up your 
Hey everybody, would you pray with me please? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this day and at this time as we study your word. We give you thanks for the implications of what it means for us to think about our own lives and how we come before you with a humble posture and an open heart. So Heavenly Father, help us to see some of the blind spots that we have and help us to grow and to understand your presence in our lives and in the midst of all our circumstances. In Jesus' name, amen. I think most of us, if not all of us, understand the concept of an honorable sacrifice. The concept of seppuku from the samurai, an honorable sacrifice where they would sacrifice themselves to restore honor to their name or to the name of their family. We see it in a lot of different politicians and we think about it in the greater political sphere that sometimes somebody will make a quote-unquote honorable sacrifice for the greater good of the party or for somebody else. Usually when we think of an honorable sacrifice, we do think of giving up something from ourselves that is going to make somebody else or something else greater. We all want honor. We want to be honored. And we want to believe that we give honor where it's due. But there's a lot of times in our lives that we don't give the proper honor to people that we should. We don't give the proper honor to God as well. As we think about this testament, we think about the time of Malachi, where he is at the end of the, the time for the Israelites uh, in their Old Testament story, as they're now going to be going into this time of uncertainty and waiting for a prophet to speak. And we eventually, 400 years later, after the time of Malachi, are going to find John the Baptist preparing the way for our Lord Jesus Christ, the great prophet, priest, and king. The people were at a time where they weren't sure if God was really listening. They had just come out of captivity, and they had helped and gotten help rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and the temple there. And then Nehemiah, who was one of the chief architects of all of this, he goes away for quite a while. And so the people are wondering, what's next for us? Well, during that time, as Nehemiah is transitioning out, we do find in Nehemiah's words that a lot of his concerns for the people of Israel and where their heart posture was before God is the same thing we're going to find in the book of Malachi. Uh, some of those chief concerns that he has and how the people are coming before God, humbling themselves before God, giving honor to God, we're going to see going to be problematic from generation to to generation to generation. And 2,000 years later, we still see that there are times in our lives where we don't give the proper and the greatest honor to our Heavenly Father. Now, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament priestly system, there was a lot of priests running around. And so here is what Malachi chapter 1 says. Here is what God is saying through the prophet Malachi to the priests who are overseeing the religious system, the sacrificial system of the Israelites of the Old Testament, because he wants them to understand some of their failings and some of their weaknesses and what they have allowed to go on. So here is what God is saying through Malachi. He says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name? But you say, how have we despised your name? This is God's response. By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals and sacrifices, is that not evil? When you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, and this is God speaking to the priests, what a weariness this is, and you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence, or is lame, or sick, and this you bring as your offering. 
Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. So if we're thinking about the Old Testament prophets, and we're thinking about the Old Testament priests and how they interact with one another, each had their own role in the life of Israel. God would speak through the prophets in order to stir up the people to return to God or to accomplish something that God had laid on the heart for the people to do. The priests were there as well, kind of a little bit in that same role, at certain times to remind the people of God's word and God's ways. But more importantly, where the prophets kind of didn't do this, the the priests were the ones who were these intermediaries between man and God. And so priests at that time were in a place kind of between God and between man where they had to please both God and man. And and it's not like today where there's just kind of one pastor over a bunch of different congregations. That's not the way the Old Testament system was. The Old Testament system was where the people went to Jerusalem and were there at the temple. And so the priests were kind of gathered there. And then there may be some prophets that were scattered throughout the land that the people could go and talk to, but they were to go to the temple for their offerings, for their sacrifices. Well, as they're going to the temple, we have to think about the geopolitical system that's going on in the world at that time. Yes, they had just come out of captivity. And if we know the story of the Old Testament after the Babylonian captivity, when Ezra and Nehemiah after him had led these different groups of Israelites back from Babylon to Israel and to Jerusalem in order to restore the nation itself or to start rebuilding it, There was a lot of animosity from the people who had just kind of over those 70 years that they were in captivity had kind of spilled into the land and kind of uh, been squatters in the land of Israel who weren't really Israelites, who weren't really followers of God. And these people had set up shop there because the Babylonians had allowed them to do that after they conquered the land of Israel and deported a lot of the people. And these people weren't real happy with this idea that they may not have the same freedoms or the same opportunities as they once upon a time had because the king, when the Persians came in and took over and conquered the Babylonians, the king gave Nehemiah and Ezra a lot of freedom to do what they did. And he kind of with his sacred seal or with his um, kingly seal said, look, you've got to follow what they're saying. And in, in addition to that, I'm sending a bunch of troops, a bunch of guards to go with them to make sure these things happen. And I'm giving them the opportunity to arm themselves so that they can keep themselves safe and one another safe while they're doing this rebuilding of the temple and of the wall and Jerusalem itself. So all of these people are already in the land of Israel who are going to cause a lot of problems. But then there's a lot of other nations who are around Israel who aren't real happy at the thought of Israel returning to some of its former glory and being having lordship over that land. Israel, if we know the place and we know kind of the way and the importance that it had thousands of years ago, it was a very important piece of land because it was an intermediary. It was an interway between a bunch of different nations. And so if Israel was going to be restored in that way, they they were going to have charge over these trade routes and they could kind of charge whatever uh, taxes or uh, whatever fees they want to kind of go through their territory or some of the cost of the, the way stations in order to find rest or food or uh, comfort things in their travels. And so there was going to be a lot of animosity that we're going to see in that 400 year period after Malachi before John the Baptist and Jesus of people not wanting the nation of Israel to succeed. So the people who are in the land there, they're trying to make a name for themselves. They're trying to make a life for themselves. This is the Israelites after they've come back from Babylon and some of the the Israelites who'd been there already uh, rejoining some of the people uh, that they haven't seen in generations. And they've got all of this going on in their lives. And so I can see where they would go to the priests and say, look, I've got to provide for my family. I've got to provide for myself. Why can't I give this instead of this at this time? And 
And as a pastor today, we have to be honest with ourselves. I have to be honest with myself when I think about the requests and some of the things that go on in people's lives here at Word of Life or at any other congregation where there's a pastor. Those pastors have to understand and deal with what is going on in the lives of the people. And sometimes circumstances are difficult. And we've got to navigate what does that mean with our posture, with our humility before God. And we have to understand and try to think from a Christian perspective on what it means to reverence Christ and what it means to reverence God with the, the offerings that we give. But we always must be about the business. And this is what God was saying to the priests. You have charge of ministering to the people. But you've got a greater charge of honoring my name. You've got a greater charge of honoring me as God. I'm the one who brought you out of this captivity. I'm the one who gave you back the land of Israel that I had promised so many hundreds and thousands of years ago. I gave you back all of these things. I allowed the king of Persia to give you this opportunity to do these things. And yet you're allowing people to think of themselves first. And for a time, God was probably okay with certain things. But if you go through the book of Nehemiah as well, you're going to see very shortly after the people return to Israel that they're already falling back into sinful patterns that we know are transcendent with time. They aren't just something specifically to 2,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, or even today. It is a mess that we get into because of sin, where we think about ourselves first and God second. But God wants to show us that when we honor His name, we are reminded of the wonderful promises that He gives to us. And so God wants us to have this honorable sacrifice before Him. And it's not sacrificing ourselves like the, the samurai did. Uh, no, we're not talking about that. We have the honorable opportunity to think of all of the blessings, all of the gifts that God gives to us, and we give God the best of what we have because He has given the best of what He has for us. Now, we think about the honorable sacrifice that God has given. And just like those samurai trying to restore the family name, God didn't have to restore anything about His name, but He had to restore His people. And so the greatest honorable sacrifice that we look to is the honorable sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ dying for each and every one of us. And that was God giving the best of himself that we might have forgiveness and we might have life. And it was the best of God giving us something that we could not give ourselves. And is the greatest challenge for us as well to remember what God says. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is going to be great in this world. I decree it. And people will offer with great joy and great humility to me that all the world might know. God wants to show the world through our sacrifices that we love God, that we honor God, that we believe in Him and the things that He has given us. To, we, we understand the blessings that He has for us so that all people might partake in it as well. And that over the course of their time and their faith journey, their spiritual growth, they might come to know God the way that we do and that they might choose to give the honorable sacrifice back to God out of all of the wonderful blessings that He has given to them. The priests of the Old Testament, and we can't be like these priests who snored at God and say, this is too much for us, God. You're asking too much. We have to deal with this. We have to deal with this. We have to deal with this. Why is this? Why can't you just accept this as a sacrifice? People are giving it. God says, no, 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 no. I deserve the highest and the best of what you have. Not something that's fifth, sixth, seventh, tenth down the line. So whoever we are, 
whether we're pastors today, and we can't be letting anybody think that it's okay to offer unacceptable sacrifices, that with a true and, and a penitent heart that we're giving God the best of what we have, we also have to wrestle with where people are at and from a, a freedom in Christ, understand uh, the power of what it now means to give in response to what God has first done for us. But we, whether we're pastors or whether I, I take away the pastor mentality, if I was to go and worship somewhere else and to offer a sacrifice at another church to God, whatever role I'm in, just like everybody else, I have to think about the honorable sacrifice that I give to God that we all understand what it means to follow and to live after the way of Jesus Christ and the uh, things that God has asked of each and every one of us to do. So from the rising of the sun to its setting, is God's name being proclaimed in what we give and what we do? Our God is a great God, and His name is worthy of praise. In all that we have and all that we do, may we honor that. In Jesus' name, amen. So Tamara, what do you take away from the message? What I take away from the message is that I need to examine what kind of sacrifices I am willing to make for God. It's not much of a sacrifice if it doesn't mean much for me um, or doesn't mean much to me. I need to give of my time and resources because it honors God and helps others, not because it's a dreaded obligation or because I give a sacrifice, quote unquote, of my time and resources, but it's easy and convenient and makes no demands of me. Um, what I hear from this is that I honor God by offering my best. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No matter where we are and with all of our worship experiences, we have to pray. We are called to pray, and we know that there are a lot of needs, a lot of prayer requests in our world today. And so tonight is no different as we're worshiping God during this Lenten season. Let's think about what is going on in our world. Let us take our prayers and our requests to our Heavenly Father. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, Heavenly Father, we come before you in humility Lord God, Heavenly Father, we know that there are times we have acted like the priests of the Old Testament where we have not honored you with our sacrifices, and we have let the sacrifices that we give not be our first fruits, the best of what we have. So Lord God, Heavenly Father, humble us in those times where we have not had a true heart in what we give so that we can honor you as you deserve. Heavenly Father, there are a lot of things going on in our world, but our attention turns toward the continuing crisis between Russia and Ukraine. And Heavenly Father, we just pray for all of those who are affected. And Lord God, Heavenly Father, we know that there is a lot of civilians, people who do not want this conflict. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you would keep them safe through it all. We pray that those who are aggressors would turn from their evil ways, that they would turn from the way of sin, lay down their arms, lay down their selfish ways, restore a way of peace. Lord God, Heavenly Father, this weekend is the Northern Illinois District Convention for us who are Missouri Synod Lutherans. And Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for that time where we as pastors and lay people will be gathering to go about the business of running your church and leading people with the message of the gospel. And so, Lord God, Heavenly Father, as those people are gathered on Friday and Saturday of this week, we pray that you would be with them, guide their discussions, grant wisdom in all things to them. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as we prepare to worship this weekend, no matter where we are and what church we worship at, we continue to pray that you would bless our worship gatherings as they are inspired and they point the way to you and the message of the cross. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we think of all of those who are sick and in need of your healing hand and your care. Lord God, Heavenly Father, there are many needs that we have. We pray for those who are struggling with cancer. We pray for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. We pray for those who are struggling with incurable diseases at this time. We pray for those who are continuing to recover from surgery. We pray for those who are in chronic and long-term pain. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are discouraged, whatever the need might be, that you would reach out and answer their calls of distress. Heavenly Father, there are many people who are traveling. 
We pray that you would keep them safe no matter where they are, especially if they are going and being in places of inclement weather. For these prayers and all the other prayers that are on our hearts, Lord, we lift them to you now in the name of your Son, Jesus, who has taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
As we close our service tonight, just want to once again thank you for being here and worshiping during this Lenten season. We hope and pray that this message was inspirational to you, but also a challenge to think about the offerings that you give. If there's anything that we can do for you, please don't hesitate to reach out, especially if you would like to know more about our Lord Jesus Christ and the message of grace and hope that he gives to all of us. We would love to connect with you. May God be with you in the week ahead.